that's Shirley Douglas. First, I would like to read regards from the Governor General, Michaela Jean. I am pleased to send greetings to all those celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Royal Alexander Theatre. It is our duty to ensure that the arts are able to thrive and remain accessible, for they are so essential to our lives. The theatrical expressions which have graced this stage for the past century have brought us together and given us a distinct voice on the international stage. That voice speaks of our diversity, of the rhythm of our lives, and our very desire to find meaning in each other's adventures. When Ed Murvish saved the Royal Alexander from demolition in 1963, it signaled a major shift in how theater was viewed in the metropolis. The passion the Murvish family felt for the arts and their contributions to the city of Toronto is guaranteed that Canada has a premier place for its rapturous audiences to enjoy the very best shows on stage. I congratulate all those involved with the Royal Alexandra and hope that the milestone renews their commitment to quality theater and to supporting the arts in Canada. Mickey Jean. I just want to speak for a moment of why a theater is so important to an actor. I know how you feel about it, but you enter from the front door. Mm -hmm. An actor's life, if you've decided that you want to make the theater your life, it's a tremendously happy, and you're very lucky if you are able to do it. I know I'm just speaking for myself, but I see many actors around who have similar experiences. I know I always eat at 4 o'clock in the afternoon for an 8 o'clock curtain. Come to the stage door at 6 o'clock. Always see that wonderful stage doorman. Into my dressing room, which is a wonderful, quiet place. And it's there that you begin to get ready for a night's performance. When you walk in, you turn the lights on. Your makeup's there, the wig master has already brought your wig. And you sit down quietly and start to get ready. I often wonder where you all are, and I know where you are, because I've also been an audience member. You're waiting for the babysitter. <laughs> You're hurrying to meet someone for dinner before the show. Somebody's holding you up in the office. Then you come to the box office and the wonderful people that work there. In the meantime, I'm doing quite well. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's, ladies and gentlemen, five minutes to curtain. And there's a buzz starts, because it's normally very quiet on the stage. And there's a lovely thing of energy and hope. Then there's the call, ladies and gentlemen, places please for the top of Act One. In the meantime, you're doing very well. <laughs> Some of you have had a drink. <laughs> the superb ushers have gotten you to your seats. It's so beautiful inside this theater and in many other theaters. You're ready and we're ready. And the house manager, who runs that whole front of the house, he's ready. He has sent his signal. And the house lights are going to come down. Where you sit, the lights are coming down. And if you've stood in the wings, as many people I see here have, and heard an overture, you could weep for a week of pure joy. <laughs> and of course, you're doing the same thing because you're hearing it for the first time at the front of the house. And the stage manager says, 
go to black, and lights up, sound, music, and the show begins. And every night for us, it is the most extraordinary honor and privilege, even when we're in bad shows that we're struggling with, we're not in that many good ones, actually. <laughs> and that's actually what makes us so brave. <laughs> I can never thank Anne Murbish enough for saying to her husband, <laughs> There's a great big theater for sale down on King Street, and I want you to get it. 